A new study suggests COVID-19 could have been in the U.S. a year ago in December 2019. The CDC says the first cases were reported in mid-January, but blood donations collected by the CDC from December 13th through January 17th were tested for SARS-CoV-2 reactive antibodies. That's the scientific name for the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Of the 7,000 samples tested, more than 100 were found to have antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. Good evening and thank you for joining us here on BNC Prime. I'm Brittany Jones in for Fred Hickman. Reporting live in Philadelphia for the Black News Channel, I'm Joy Clark. Thank you, Dre, for that report. Well, people are starting to become more hopeful as coronavirus vaccines are getting ready for distribution. San Antonio could get a supply as early as mid-December, but there are phases to this vaccination process. Some people concerned about what the vaccine entails, its side effects, and when they'll be able to actually get it. Courtney Freeman reports. The current... Protesters say there's no place in Joe Biden's cabinet for Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. As Anita Bennett reports. Welcome back to date. We have not seen fraud on the scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. Those were the words straight from U.S. Attorney General William Barr's mouth today. This after President Trump has made claim after claim of election fraud. Joining us now to talk more about this is our chief legal correspondent, Dr. Laura McNeil. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Brittany. Well, Dr. McNeil, first, Attorney General Barr's statement says a lot, but can you tell us a little more about the lawsuit Trump's legal team filed in the state of Wisconsin today, despite Barr's announcement? Yes, I have to admit the timing of Barr's announcement is, as we say, poetic. Uh, essentially, what this recent lawsuit in Wisconsin is alleging is that the Wisconsin election officials altered uh, certification of absentee ballots. What does that mean? Well, it means that some ballots were submitted that maybe were missing the address of a witness that was required to certify or, or witness that you actually signed the absentee ballot. And so with some of the Wisconsin election officials allegedly did is they said, you know what, we're going to look up this person's address. If it's in it's part of public record, we're going to go ahead and add the address. And so the Trump administration is saying that violates Wisconsin law and that those ballots should be turned, should not be counted. Um, additionally, another claim, as an example, there's several claims in this lawsuit uh, that uh, was filed today, is that the events that were held that were called democracy in the park, essentially an opportunity for individuals to cast their absentee ballots, were held in locations that were not approved polling stations for those election counties. And so I could go on and on. Essentially, Trump's at uh, legal team, what they've done is they've thrown any and every possible uh, legal claim, hoping that one of them will stick. And as we've seen for the past weeks post-election, none of their claims have stuck. They've all been frivolous claims. Uh, one judge after another have thrown their cases out because they lack merit, and there's simply no evidence to support their claims. And since Wisconsin is considered a battleground state, is there any possibility that this lawsuit might impact the election? Uh, absolutely not. It's, it would be a complete long shot. It's, the reality is Wisconsin, like many battleground states, has already certified their election results. And the election law is very clear with respect to this area. It says that if you cast your state, meaning the state, uh, certifies their election results by December 8th, that they can't be challenged. Congress is legally bound to accept Wisconsin's election results because they met that December 8th deadline. And so really what I think is happening is that President Trump is looking ahead. I think this is pure political strategy. Uh, there was a recent report today in the New York Times that stated that his campaign has raised $170 million since the election. Um, so I think this is just another attempt to continue to rally his base for a possible 2024 run, um, as well as making sure that he maintains that stronghold he currently has on the Republican Party. Hmm. So why do you think the presidential, the president's legal team is targeting only two counties in Wisconsin as opposed to the entire state? 
you know, I have to be honest with you, it was very disconcerting. Uh, those two counties, which are Dane County and Milwaukee County, have the largest Democratic populace. Um, additionally, they also have the largest Black populace, voting populace. And the reason that's been very unnerving for a lot of members of our community is that it's no big secret that in the U.S. there's a long history of voter disenfranchisement of Black voters. And so now you have a president targeting two counties out of the whole state that have the largest black voting block, you know, it makes you pause and, and wonder, you know, how intentional is this? And so, uh, again, they're probably baseless claims, so I wouldn't put much merit on them, but it's very disconcerting that he's targeting those black communities. And lastly, Dr. McNeil, we know that the majority of states such as Georgia and Arizona have their certified have certified their results, their election results. Rather, what can we expect in the days ahead as we draw closer to the December 14th Electoral College vote? Well, Brittany, as my father always says, if you're not careful, history has a chance of repeating itself. And so I think we're going to see a repeat of additional lawsuits being filed uh, by President Trump. Again, if we see the same pattern, they will be frivolous lawsuits. But what's more concerning and what we really need to keep an eye on is to make sure that our electoral college process is not compromised in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we all know the 2016 uh, presidential election, there were more than five faithless electors who did not vote based on their state's populist vote. So I'm really, really concerned about that, and I think it's very important for us as Americans, as voters, to make sure we keep a close eye on that process. I guess we got to wait to see what happens. Dr. Laura McNeil, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, still to come tonight, if you're planning on shipping something to a loved one, you may want to get a move on. There could be some delays this year. We'll tell you why coming up next. Welcome back everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to record online shopping numbers, but the increase could mean heartache for some holiday shoppers. And we don't want to delay Santa. Eric Cox has advice on how to get those gifts under your tree in time. Eric. Yes, good evening, ladies. That's right. I've spent the entire day looking into all the shipping issues that our country's facing in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, including talking to a shipping expert about his advice. Take a look. The Today is World AIDS Day, a day to remember all those lost to the virus, but also a time to celebrate how far society has come when it comes to research and medication. Yeah, so one group in New York City focuses on helping newly diagnosed people learn to live with the virus. Ashley Liotis is in New York with more on Alliance for Positive Change. More than like uh, putting the animals on Noah's Ark, uh, taking them out two at a time. You know, we are fighting to say that they don't take any of our children by using excessive use of force. Stop the vehicle. The death of two teens has left a South Florida community devastated. This dash cam video on your screen from the November 13th incident shows the fatal moment a deputy fired into the car, killing 18 year old Sincere Pierce and 16 year old Angelo Crooms. Now that shooting is opening up a conversation about law enforcement policy. Should deputies be allowed to fire into a vehicle? Reporter Maris Badcock looked into the Brevard County Sheriff's Office policy and how it compares to other law enforcement in Central Florida. Dash cam video of a Brevard. The reigning Eastern Conference champs unveil what could be the most stylish uniform in all of sports. It is hard to beat these new city edition jerseys for the heat. They call them their new Miami Vice uniforms. And is there any uniform that is better in the league today? Brittany, uh, what do you think? Thumbs up? Looks like cotton candy. That is a fair assessment. <laughs> But do you like them or no? I, I do like it. I kind of dig it a little bit. All right, I like them too. Laverne mm -hmm. McGee does as well. Uh, we asked her during the 4 o'clock show. Uh, when will they debut these in uniforms? Who knows? Uh, they're not their primary uniforms, so will not be often. When they do, they will change the look of the court as well. So uh, well done, Miami Heat. The college basketball season enters its second week, and last night, an HBCU had to come back. Done enough. We can do more. All right, so Brittany, uh, this guy a champion both on and off the track. Uh, we certainly wish him a speedy recovery uh, as he will miss the first race of his F1 career this weekend. Uh, again, it's a career that has seen him now capture seven F1 titles that is tied for the most all time. But this is a guy who 
is just loaded with money, uh, net worth through the roof, doesn't have to be as vocal as he is uh, when it comes to diversity and equality, but he is. So uh, we salute him for that and again, certainly wish him the very best. Definitely a salute to him. And it also goes to show you that these celebrities, these football players, all of these um, sports guys are not immune to getting COVID-19. This is true. Uh, you know, we talk about it all the time. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It does not matter your uh, race, gender, uh, sexual preference, it does not matter. Uh, so uh, as he echoed, uh, we echo what he said in his statement there, uh, for everybody to be safe and take the proper measures to protect yourselves. All right, thank you, Anthony. We're going to take a short break. Tested for coronavirus four times a week. Still, she's got to be responsible. She's got so many followers and kids who look up to her. And in such a critical pandemic like this, she absolutely has to stick to the rules like everybody else, celebrity or not. For sure. I mean, you think about it. My family did things differently this year. They decided we did to go boxes. No one was gathering like that. And they told us that we need to make sure that we didn't do those types of things so people didn't get sick. Yeah, very important. But that's it for us right now. DC Prime tonight is up next, then BNC Prime is back for nine at 9 p.m. Have a good evening, everyone.